Wonder of the Wasteland, Chapter 9, Part 2. Not until he felt a drag in his steps did he think of his weakened condition. Resting a while in the shade of a tree, he let the burrow graze on the scant brush and then went on again. Thus he traveled on with frequent rests until the heat made it imperative for him to halt till afternoon. About the middle of the afternoon, he packed and set forth again. A direct line westward appeared to be bringing him closer to the slope of the mountains, and it was not long before he saw a thick patch of green brush that surely indicated a water hole. The very sight seemed to invigorate him. Nevertheless, the promised oasis was far away, and not before he had walked till he was weary and rested many times did he reach it. To find water and grass was like making a thrilling discovery. Adam unpacked Jenny and turned her loose, not, however, without some misgivings as to her starving there, staying there. Though he suffered from an extreme fatigue and a weakness that seemed to be in both muscle and bone, a kind of cheer came to him with the campfire duties. Never had he been so fat famished. The sun set while he ate, and despite his hunger, more than once he had to stop to gaze down across the measureless slope, smoky and red, that ended in purple obscurity. It struck him suddenly as he was putting some sticks of dead ironwood on the fire, how he had ceased to look back over his shoulder toward the south. The fire sputtered, the twilight deepened, the silence grew vast and vague. His eyelids were as heavy as lead and all the nerves and veins of his body seemed to run together and to sink into an abyss the restfulness of which was unutterably sweet. Sometime during Adam's slumbers, a nightmare possessed him. At the moment he was about to be captured, he awakened, cold with clammy sweat and shaking in every limb. With a violent start of consciousness, with fearful uncertainty, he raised himself to peer around. The desert night encompassed him. It was late, somewhere near the morning hour, and low down over the dark horizon line hung a wan, distorted moon that shone with weird luster. Adam saw the black mountain wall above him apparently lifting to the stars, and the thick shadow of gloom filling the mouth of the canyon where he lay. He listened, and then he breathed a long sigh of relief and lay back in his blankets. The silence was that of a grave. There were no pursuers, he'd only dreamed. And he closed his eyes again, feeling some blessed safeguard in the fact of his loneliness. Dawn roused him to his tasks, stronger physically, eager and keen, but more watchful than he'd been the preceding day, and with less thrill than he had felt. He packed in half an hour and was traveling west when the sun rose. Gradually, with the return of his habit of watchfulness, came his former instinctive tendency to look back over his shoulder. He continually drove this away, and it continually returned. The only sure banishment of it came through action, with its attendant exercise of his faculties. Therefore, he rested less and walked more, taxing his strength to its utmost that morning, until the hot noon hour forced him to a halt. Then, while Jenny nibbled at the bitter desert plants, Adam dozed in the thin shade of a mesquite. Close by grew a large ocotilla cactus covered with red flowers among which bees hummed. Adam never completely lost sense of this melodious hum, and he seemed to be trying to revive memories of that he shunned. The sun was still high, and Adam when resumed travel, but it was westering and the slanting rays were bearable. After he got thoroughly warmed up and sweating freely, he didn't mind the heat, 
and was able to drive Jenny and keep up a strong stride for an hour at a time. His course now led along the base of the mountain wall and that long low edge which marked his destination began to seem less unattainable. The afternoon waned, the sun sank, the heat declined, and Jenny began to show signs of weariness. It bothered Adam to keep her headed straight. He searched the line where the desert slope met the mountain wall for another green thicket of brush marking a water hole, but he couldn't see one. Darkness overtook him and he was compelled to make dry camp. This occasioned him some e uneasiness, not that he did not have plenty of water for himself, but because he worried about the burrow and the possibility of not finding water the next day. Nevertheless, he slept soundly. On the following morning, when he had been tramping along for an hour or more, he spied far ahead the unmistakable green patch of thicket that heralded the presence of water. The sight stirred him. He walked well that morning, resting only a couple of hours at noon. But the green patch, after the manner of distant objects on the desert, seemed just as far away as when he saw it first. The time came, however, when there was no more illusion, and he knew he was getting close. At last he reached it, a large green thicket that choked the mouth of a narrow canyon. He found a spring welling up from under the mountain base, sending a slender stream out to be swallowed by the sand. Adam gave Jenny a drink before he unpacked her. There was a desirable campsite, except that it lacked dead firewood close at hand. Adam, remo Adam removed the pack, being careful to put boxes and bags together and to cover them with the canvas. Then he started out to look for some dead ironwood or mesquite to burn. All the desert growths, mostly greasewood and mesquite, were young and green. And Adam searched in one direction and then in another without so much as finding a stick. Next, he walked west along the rocky wall and had no better success until he came to a deep recession in the wall, full of brush. And here, with considerable labor, he collected a bundle of dry sticks. With this, he trudged back toward camp. Before long, he imagined, he saw smoke. Queer. How those smoke trees fool a fellow, he said. And even after he thought he smelled smoke, he was sure of deception. But upon nearing the green thicket that hit his camp, he actually did see thin blue smoke low down against the background of rocky wall. The sight alarmed him. The only explanation which offered itself to his perplexity was the possibility that a prospector had arrived at the spring during his absence and had started a fire. Adam began to hurry. His alarm increased to dread. When he ran around the corner of thicket to his campsite, he did see a fire. It was about burned out. Now, there was no prospector, no signs of packs or burrows, and Jenny was gone. What, what, stammered Adam, dropping his bundles of sticks. He was bewildered, a sense of calamity beset him. He ran forward, where's, where's my pack, he cried. The dying fire was but the smoldering remains of his pack. It had been burned. Blankets, boxes, bags had been consumed. Some black, blackened utensils lay on the ground near the charred remains of his canvas. Only then, then did the truth of this catastrophe burst upon him. All his food had been burned. End of chapter 9